Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is the sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle I saw you had, and I hear that I still have. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness or compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing being in spirit and, of one, and in vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves. Rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each to you in the interests of others. In the relationships of one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who in being in very nature God did not consider equality with God, but something to be used in his own advantage. Rather, he made something by taking his very nature of the servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted himself to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all others' names, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and enact in order to fill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you home firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink, offering to the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, for I've also been cheered from where I received news for you. Have no one else like him who will have genuine concern for your faith. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not only for Jesus Christ, but you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son of his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back Ephroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because he heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God has mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send to him that you will see him again. You may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honour, people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Thank you, Jane, and we thank God for the reading of his word. Um, I'm always reminded when we sit down and listen to scripture of one of the comments that a lecturer made um, as we were at college when he said, the reading of God's word is the only guarantee you'll hear anything inspired 
during a Sunday sermon. So uh, it's good that we've had a chance to really dig into a big chunk of scripture there. Can I, yeah, can I mind? Thanks, Vicky. Right, thank you. One commentator sums up the passage we've just read in this way. Paul knows that love for God will lead to love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and therefore that we can work together to serve others. I could leave it there, but I can't help but feel that you might somehow be not very impressed with a two-line sermon, so I'd better expand on it a little. This section of Paul's letter to the church at Philippi touches on different aspects of the Christian life, how we should live out our faith, our relationships with each other, our witness to others, and the unity that should bind all this together. This morning, as we continue our series on growing in our faith, we're going to just focus on the first four verses of chapter two and see what it means to be united in Christ. The chapter begins with the word, therefore, or as other translations might put it, if, or so. Those words are really important as they remind the reader to reflect on what's been said before. Paul had been telling the church what would happen if they lived lives worthy of the gospel, how they would be able to stand firm in the strength of the Holy Spirit, working together unafraid of opposition unable to stand up for their faith even in the face of the suffering that they were experiencing the unity that Paul was describing was a collective unity that was and is essential for a church to function in its missional calling in the faces of all the challenges that they will, it will face and as Paul's letter continues, he will again highlight the importance of unity, linking back to the unity previously described, a unity that's needed in a world that's hostile to the gospel. But now he will raise it up to another level. Unity is not just a useful weapon against the world, but it lies at the very core of what it means to be a believer. The unity that Paul wants to highlight is a way in which, as Christians, we live out the gospel. How we live out what the gospel means to us. It's the unity that defines Christ's church and the believers, you and I, who make up that church. It's a unity that's defined by our character and our attitude. The unity that Paul is talking about is the hallmark of the gospel. It's the badge of distinctive Christianity. It says to all who see it, this life is worthy of the gospel. And we can be in no doubt how important this unity was to Paul when he says, make my joy complete. We've got to remember again that Paul's writing this letter as a prisoner. If we were in prison, chained, guarded, unjustly accused, insulted and abused by those who perhaps we thought were friends, with no comfort, no guarantee of any future, what would our joy be? Would we have any joy at all? Well, Paul certainly did. For Paul, it was firstly spiritual. Secondly, it was concerned with the welfare of others. And thirdly, it was engrossed in the whole topic of unity. Paul is saying that his happiness will be complete if he just hears that the Philippians are united, especially as he knew that there were disagreements going on. Paul was telling us Sorry, telling them, and he tells us today, the life that's truly worthy of the gospel is a life of unity. That the life of unity is the one that Jesus himself wants for his church and all of us who make up that body. 
But it goes without saying that Paul's talking about a very specific unity. Paul being Paul, it wouldn't be his way just to throw out an idea without explaining exactly what he meant. And to, true to form, his teaching on this subject is typical of what he does numerous times in his other letters. First, he gives us all the facts, and then the exhortations. And verse 1 gives us the facts. For the word if is not a question, but a statement. Paul is saying, if, as is certainly the case... And then the exhortations begin in verse 2. First of all, it's a corporate one, a collective one. And then verses 3 and 4 about our own individual responsibility. So let's have a little, bit, a, bit, a little look and a bit more detail at what Paul means in these verses. What he was saying to the church at Philippi. And how those words speak to us as New Life Baptist Church. be honest the unity that Paul talks about in verse 1 is not so easy to achieve when people who come from different backgrounds each with their own unique characters and temperaments found themselves sharing one another's company but having said that Paul makes it clear to the church at Philippi that as the people of Christ they had all they needed to make such unity possible through the fellowship that they had with him in Christ's love, there's a comfort that makes up for all the troubles and difficulties that are inseparable from living out the Christian life in the world. From his risen life, they draw encouragement and strength because they share in it. They've received the spirit of Christ, binding them together in a fellowship of love. He dwells within them both as individuals and as a company of believers. And through him, God has poured out his love into their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit who maintains that common unity and binds them together as a body. And the effect of this common life should be tender and compassionate hearts. The same tenderness and compassion they received when they first met Jesus. They've experienced his tenderness and compassion. And as a result, they can and should display the same qualities. To put it in its simplest, all the conditions existed within that believing community at Philippi to promote a sense of oneness and togetherness. And those same conditions exist here at New Life Baptist Church. And I would suggest we've seen those in some of the conversations we've seen this morning. Then we see in verse 2 that there was already sufficient evidence of this oneness of purpose and a mutual affection within the church to give Paul reason to be joyful. At the beginning of chapter 1, he'd already said that his prayers for the Philippian Christians were joyful ones. And now he says, fill my cup of joy to the brim. Make my joy complete. Let me hear that you are like-minded, having the same love, that you are united in spirit and purpose. Paul isn't advocating that they should all share or have the same thoughts, but that their common purpose should be to work together and to serve one another. Paul tells them that they should have the attitude of Christ, himself reminding them that Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant now this isn't a matter of making everybody seem eye to eye or have the same opinion on every subject we're not meant to be clones 
And church life, God, how dull and boring would that be if we were all exactly the same? What we want is that sense of give and take that comes when a range of opinions and views give rise to friendly discussion and debate. As there no doubt was at Philippi, there are times when perhaps our conversations can get a bit spirited. But that's okay if what we do and say comes from the right place and for the right reasons. We can disagree. We can maybe not see eye to eye. But it's why and how we go about that that really matters, which leads us on to verse 3. Here Paul draws our attention to the individual's response to this question of unity and how our attitudes and our motives are so important. Having the right attitude is one of the principal characteristics that needs to be present in the life of the believer. The, the discussions that abate are so important to the life of the church they cease to be friendly, they cease to be useful when people are only interested in scoring points and maybe getting their own way. And I'm sure we'll have all seen examples of that. The disciple John faced this himself with a dictatorial church leader in Asia who rejected all the teachers that he sent to the church in his third letter, he wrote about this leader saying, I wrote to the church but by Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, says Paul. That's the main enemy of unity and harmony within a church. And in Galatians, Paul says, selfish ambition is listed among the acts of the sinful nature. There is no pray, place for pride in the Christian life. In fact, the complete opposite is what's true, and that's humility. But it's interesting that humility wasn't regarded as a valuable virtue in the pagan culture of Paul's day. Where in fact the literal translation of the Greek word which we here translate as humility meant mean spiritedness. The complete opposite of what we're talking about. But the Old Testament attitude is the complete polar opposite. Where we see how God mocks the proud but shows favour to those who are humble. Those words taken from Proverbs were ones that both Peter and James would use in their own letters. Humility is a characteristic that should be seen in the life of the Christian because Jesus himself tells us, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart. His first disciples, they found that a lesson, a hard one to learn. We think back to the discussions they had about who would be greatest in the kingdom of God. There wasn't a lot of humility evidence there. But Jesus would gently tell them that his followers' true greatness was marked by being least of all, being a servant to all as he was. It is such an important characteristic, but we can still struggle with it. There's a story told about a well-known and respected American preacher from the last century who struggled himself with this. He was once convicted about his lack of humility uh, by a friend. And, who, and this friend suggested that possibly as a remedy that he marched through the streets of Chicago of Chicago, wearing one of those sandwich boards with the words from Philippians 2, 3 to 5 that we've read written on them. As, a, as he walked around, he was to shout them out for all to hear. And he agreed to do this. 
And that's exactly what he did. And when he returned to his study, he removed the board and he said, I bet there's not another man in the entire town who would do that. I would suggest that his friend's suggestion didn't work in that particular case. Paul then says, in, in humility, value others above yourselves. Paul isn't saying that everybody else is more gifted or superior to each of us, but that Christian love should encourage us to see others of worthy of preferential treatment. That's the point that Paul made to the church in Rome when he said, be devoted to one another in love, honour one another above yourselves. Paul may well say this in a very simple and straightforward way, but we do need to face up to the fact that it is frequently easier said than done. When we really try to consider others before ourselves, we often discover that it doesn't come naturally. It's far too in easy to introduce, how can I put it, what we consider are justifiable reasons to ignore that, perhaps exceptions to Paul's rule, both as individuals and, of course, as a complete church body. Look at the conversations and attitudes that are often voiced and displayed among the different expressions of church. The viewpoint then convinces one church that they've got it right and all the others have it wrong. The conviction that because of a perceived area in a church's theology, that we couldn't possibly work with them. The, work, the certainty that the way that we do church is the only way. I could go on and on. Paul makes it clear that as far as he's concerned, there's no place for these exceptions where there is real humility. And the prophet Micah, centuries before Paul, saw that what God requires from us is for us to walk humbly with him. It's as simple as that. If we truly did that, and I suggest our churches would be noticeably better. And we, as people, most definitely would be. And then in the last verse that we're looking at, Paul highlights the importance, and indeed, if you like, the duty we have to look to the interests of others, not just our own. In his letter to the church at Galatia, he says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. It wasn't a law that Christ just gave to the church, but one that he himself demonstrated time and time again in his own life and ministry. And Paul in Romans expands on this even further when he says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each, each of us should please our neighbours for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself. The example of how Jesus himself lived is so often the evidence that Paul points us to concerning how we should behave, not least when it comes to the unselfish concern for the well-being of others. If we're to follow Christ's example, then it's better to be concerned about other people's rights and our own duties than about our rights and other people's duties. In Corinthians 6, we read how believers in the church were taking their fellow believers to court, to the secular court, in order to get some sort of redress. Paul very quickly challenged that behaviour and the damage that it was causing to the reputation of the Christian faith. He tells them that it would be more in keeping with Christ's example 
to suffer wrong without redress, rather than to bring his name into disrepute. Sadly, there are times when this might have to happen if one Christian is harmed by another. There have been several very high-profile cases involving leaders of churches who have been accused of bullying or sexual misconduct. And it would be wrong, very wrong, for churches to sweep that under the carpet. But the reputational damage is huge. And so in these four verses, Paul has mapped out to the church at Philippi what lies at the heart of Christian unity. And it begins, quite simply, with Christ. In him we are saved, and as a result we have a personal relationship with him. We have the comfort and insurance of the deep love that he has for each one of us, because he died to take away our sin and to give us eternal life. We have the Holy Spirit living within us, drawing us into relationship with him and with one another. And out of that should come tenderness and compassion, a real care and sympathy for one another. That's the true source of Christian unity. And from here, all the characteristics and attributes that Paul has highlighted can and should be found. Paul addressed this letter to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi. But these verses we've looked at today could just as easily have been addressed to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at New Life Baptist Church. They are a real challenge to us as a church and indeed the Christian church around the world. Because all that Paul has described is attainable, but sadly we often miss the mark, both as individuals and as churches. But it doesn't have to be like that. Because in him we can do it, but only when our attitude truly does become the attitude of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. I pray that all of us will take Paul's words to heart and work towards real unity in Christ because what a force of good we could be for this city and beyond. Let's pray. Lord, we we just want to say thank you for these words that really speak into what true unity is means when we are brought together in Jesus. And Lord, we know that there are many things that we do well, but there will always be more that we can do. And as we look to Paul's words, they should encourage us and challenge us to really seek that unity. I'm sure, Lord, as we all sit here, we can only begin to wonder what could be accomplished in this city and beyond if all your churches were united, if we all truly operated as one. But Lord, we just ask that you would, here in this church in which you've placed us, would you draw us into that sense of unity? Lord, would you make that stronger? Would you make it closer? Would you make us more dependent on one, an- on one another with you as our head? Would you inspire us to really be united in Christ, the people you intended us to be? In your name we ask this. Amen.